Welcome to Oceanography from the University of Wisconsin in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, near the center of the universe. My name is Eric Hyatt, and this video is the first in a series of videos to finish out the semester online. This one in particular summarizes the first half of the semester of the course. So it should be fun. Let's dive right in. Spring break was amazing. Uh, Sophie and I spent uh, quite a bit of time down at the beach on Lake Winnebago, just in soaking up the sun. And before we get back into the, the course, I want to do a quick recap of the topics that we've covered so far and make some connections with where we're going and what we're doing. And the first part of the course, I did an introduction into how the oceans and climate and life and resources are all very interconnected. And I discussed the importance of the oceans, even for people here in the middle of the continent, the oceans are hugely important because of the role that they play in terms of climate and climate change, uh, origin of life, and lots and lots of our resources come from the oceans, even here in Wisconsin. I discuss the importance of science and how that works and try to show you that science is really a process more than a method. Uh, it's very different than a belief system. It's a way of looking at the world. We did a section on how the earth has evolved and became the water planet, how the oceans got here basically. And that starts with the position in the solar system and the role that like the evolution of the sun and the solar system have played with the oceans and atmosphere here on earth. And I pointed out to you that the early sun was about 15% dimmer. It's gaining in luminosity through time. And so it's, it's growing in strength through time. And then from that, we discussed greenhouse atmosphere, greenhouse gases, greenhouse effect. I pointed out to you that on the early Earth, we think that the greenhouse atmosphere was really intense, like carbon dioxide concentrations, we think, instead of a trace gas like it is today, it was 20, maybe even 30% of the total atmosphere. So we had an extreme greenhouse atmosphere to make up for the the more dim sun. It was kind of a good relationship between the two fact to keep the earth from freezing. And then we, we discussed some of the complex feedbacks, like the reflectivity of the earth. Um, another term for that is albedo. And from there, we discussed biogeochemistry. So this is like our first introduction into the relationships between chemistry, biology, and geology on the earth and we started with carbon and the carbon cycle. Focus first on the inorganic side of the carbon cycle, and that's carbonate. So CO2 dissolves in water, and a little bit of that CO2 reacts with water and hydrolyzes and makes carbonate, bicarbonate, carbonic acid, makes that whole system, which then could be used for, by organisms to build their skeletons. So things like calcifying algae and corals and snails and clams can all precipitate calcium carbonate and pull that essentially the CO2, carbon and CO2, out of the atmosphere in, through the ocean into the carbonate system to make calcite, the mineral calcite, and another mineral associated with calcite called aragonite. And then that can become, those two can become limestone. So we talked about that and I spoke to you about the carbon reservoirs here. I've just summarized that in a table that I gave you in class and then I've summarized it here in this uh, presentation. So I'll show you that in a second. We discussed some of the interactions between life and feedbacks between photosynthesis, respiration, and the carbon cycle in general. And I pointed out to you to build up CO2 in the atmosphere, you have to store some of the organic carbon in sediment get it out of the system. Uh, otherwise, it just recycles back to the atmosphere through respiration and oxidation. So we use that very simple relationship of photosynthesis and simple, it's not a simple reaction, not a simple system, but I gave you a very simplified version of a chemical reaction that represented photosynthesis. And we let that stand in for the organic component 
of the carbon cycle. And yeah, we went there. We discussed methane. Um, it can be a pretty stinky subject, but a very important subject for global climate and the carbon cycle. And we discussed how methane may actually be one of the big wild cards in the climate system, climate change system today. And discussed some more of the, these complex feedbacks, which fits really nicely with methane because there's lots of methane, as I showed you, uh, in sediments and permafrost around the world. And if you warm up the oceans and you warm up the permafrost a little bit, it releases methane. And methane is a really strong greenhouse gas, so you get more warming. So it's a positive feedback that we discussed. And then we discussed oxygen. So oxygen is another very important, biologically important element and molecule. And I pointed out to you that oxygen on this planet, it's basically not natural to have oxygen gas in the atmosphere. Oxygen gas, as I pointed out, is combustible, dangerous, explosive, chemically reactive, and it actually damages cells. Who knew? This gas that we need to survive is also pretty dangerous. The natural form of oxygen on this planet is in rocks. And if you take a typical rock that makes up the continents, like granite, um, a granite countertop, for example, is about 55% by weight oxygen. So 55 weight percent oxygen. That just is like one of the really interesting facts about how the earth works and where some of these elements are distributed that most of the oxygen on this planet is actually in rocks. So here's that table I mentioned before. Uh, I made this table based on carbon reservoir categories, categories and then estimates of how many grams carbon for each one of those reservoirs. And what I did was I converted all the numbers, all the results into the same exponent. So they're all 10 to the 17. So in the atmosphere, for example, there's six grams of carbon times 10 to the 17. So 17 zeros after that six. It allows us to compare the relative sizes of these carbon reservoirs at or near the surface and, and inside the earth. And the first thing you'll notice is how much larger the ocean carbon reservoir is relative to the atmosphere. Okay, and if you look up here, the calculation comes out to be about 67 times larger. So the oceans are the dog and the atmosphere is a, a little tail on the dog. So those are very important and a very important comparison between the two. Land biota, that's plants, animals, us, is about seven. And then soils, all the organic matter in soils around the world, about 20. So it's getting to be quite a bit. But this first one that I highlighted in this kind of pink red box are carbonate rocks, and that's limestone and dolostone. Look at the size of this reservoir, 650,000 times 10 to the 17 grams of carbon. This is where most of the carbon near or at the Earth's surface is stored. It's stored as a solid. This started out as CO2, carbon dioxide, reacted with water, hydrolyzed, and was precipitated and became a seafloor sediment, usually in clear tropical water, and then buried and became limestone. So have some respect for limestone. When you're walking on a, a driveway sometime when it has crushed limestone on it, first of all, that was, it's all dead stuff. It's all the remains of once living organisms. Every little piece of that is once was once living, but also you're walking on solid CO2. You're walking on calcium bonded to carbonate. And the carbonate component, which is about half, about 60% of the weight is in the carbonate. And that comes from the atmosphere, from CO2. So the greenhouse gas, CO2, has been sequestered away in limestone and dolostone over the Earth's history and resulting in this big carbonate, this big carbon reservoir at and slightly below the surface. The other one that we talk most about, that most people discuss, is this one, it's the second largest near or at the Earth's surface, and that's sedimentary organic matter. So this is petroleum, oil, uh, gasoline that you put in your car, natural gas, and coal that we burn for electricity. Those are major components of this, this part, this fraction, 
but most of that is actually just disseminated organic matter in sedimentary rocks like shales and sandstones and things like that but know that it's less than a sixth the size one sixth sixth one sixth the size of carbonate rocks so it's the smaller of the two rock forms of carbon and it's it's smaller so when we burn fossil fuels today we're we're digging up and pumping out organic matter from rocks that was buried, fixed through photosynthesis maybe 50 million years ago, maybe 200 million years ago, and we burn it today to produce energy and release the CO2 back into the atmosphere. That CO2 was sequestered away into the crust maybe 50 million years ago or 200 million years ago. And then finally, I pointed out to you in class, that surprisingly the upper mantle still contains a lot of carbon and most of this carbon the stable form of carbon in the mantle as a crystal and solid form anyway is diamond so it shows there must be a lot of diamond left inside the mantle and then we focus specifically on the biosphere geosphere evolution through earth history deep time is another way to say it and we looked at some of the major events and I plotted up in class and we drew this in class a time scale from today at zero back to four and a half billion years ago and on this scale this is in millions of years thousands of millions so 4500 million is 4.5 billion that's the age of the earth and the first thing that we plotted on this diagram was the range the time range that bacteria have existed and we have fossil evidence of them at 3.5 billion years ago there's chemical evidence that suggests they were around maybe as far back as 3.9 billion years ago and of course we have them around today they're like your friends and mine lots of bacteria we have lots of bacteria inside of our human bodies and on our bodies and all over the place so they're around today so this is their range it extends back at least three and a half billion years of continuous life on the planet as bacteria prokaryotic life and then the next thing we did was we made this kind of relative crude um, plot of an, an estimation of how much oxygen is in the atmosphere and this is in percent so this is oxygen gas in the atmosphere over time and it starts out at about uh, 3 billion years ago, comes up and starts increasing a little tiny, tiny bit. And it's hard to show on that graph. The marker was too thick, actually, so it's very exaggerated. It's not really to scale. We think this was much less than 1% in the atmosphere. It, it would be more on the scale of how much CO2 is in the atmosphere today. It's a trace gas. in organisms, cyanobacteria, photosynthetic bacteria that adapted and diversified especially at about this time and that's the great oxygenation event GOE we think that's when cyanobacteria diversified and was took over all kinds of environments in the surface oceans around the world and started making oxygen there wasn't a huge increase of oxygen with that event in the atmosphere and the reason why is the earth had to rust so there was lots of iron on the earth, lots of other elements, and essentially they had to chemically react before you could release oxygen gas into the atmosphere and have it exist as a free gas. So one of the things that is really fundamental here at this time, in this time zone, the oceans were precipitating iron, rust, and it was forming as a seafloor sediment. So you could think of it, really all the big iron deposits date from about this time period from about 2.5 billion years ago to about 1.9 billion years ago that's where your car came from so your car formed as a marine sediment precipitated on the seafloor the steel the iron that makes the steel in your car formed on the seafloor about 2 billion years ago and it formed as a result of this oxygenation of the earth now oxygen gradually built up through time just maybe up to a percent or two and then another biological event happened and that's the evolution appearance and diversification of single-celled eukaryotic algae 
And so now we have another oxygen source in the oceans, in the surface water, producing much more oxygen. And now oxygen levels raise up into the percent uh, zone. And it wasn't until this big kick right about here, that's when land plants evolved. So these are the first forests, the first plants on land that produced an additional source of oxygen. And today about half of our oxygen that we're breathing today to keep us alive comes from land plants. And that gradually kicked us up to about 21% that we have today. Now we contrasted this oxygen curve to the CO2 curve on Earth. And this is a, an estimate but we think the early Earth had 20 to 30 percent of the atmosphere as CO2, and it gradually started to decrease as life started to produce organic matter that got buried on the seafloor. And some points we think that life kind of got a little out of control and was very prolific in terms of making organic matter that was sinking to the seafloor and being preserved in sediments. And we think that there's times in Earth history where that occurred and it pulled the CO2 down and it produced a reverse greenhouse effect. And so we get cooling and a big ice age. And this is the first big global ice age called Snowball Earth One. And in that, in that situation, we think that sea ice and glaciers covered the continents essentially to the equator. And the Earth, if you looked at it from space, would have looked like a snowball. It would have been white instead of blue. CO2 gradually decreases as life continues to diversify and we're producing more and more organic matter that gets buried and we're burying more and more calcium carbonate through time that's precipitating from the oceans forming limestones. Another big diversification of life, and I mentioned it here, the evolution of eukaryotic, eukaryotic organisms and algae that are producing oxygen, but they're also producing a lot of organic matter and some of that a little bit of it is getting buried throughout time and CO2 was sequestered again out of the atmosphere and produced another ice age and this is the second and probably the last we hope uh, snowball earth event where the earth was went into an extreme ice age and again glaciers and sea ice extended essentially to the equator we think now that there were probably some open areas of water near the equator at this time. It maybe wasn't totally covered by sea ice, but if you would have seen the Earth from space, it would have looked like a giant snowball in space, white instead of uh, blue. And then other events, like the evolution of land plants, brought down uh, CO2 further, produced more oxygen. And we had a couple times in Earth history where that process got out of whack again, particularly like 300 million years ago, there was a big ice age where lots of coal was being uh, deposited around the continents. And that produced um, a dip in CO2, reverse greenhouse effect, and probably another ice age. And now we're, we're in an ice age today as CO2 is continually fallen, now it's a trace gas. So we go from 20 to 30% of the atmosphere to 400 parts per million and 400 parts per million if you do the math is 0.04 percent so four hundredths of one percent it's a trace gas in the atmosphere today it plays a big role because it's a greenhouse uh, gas but it's much much less than it has been in the past on the planet and then the second part of the course we discussed uh, exploration and very interesting topic because um, if you like history, if you like kind of the relationships between politics, economics, and geology, resources, and exploration, it makes for a very interesting topic. It's interesting from the standpoint of the history of science and technology, too. And we, we spoke about lots of those aspects. So we, we spoke about what led to ocean exploration. A lot of economic drivers actually learned about latitude and longitude and how to relate those to distance and then time and how to do the calculations and conversions between degrees, minutes, and seconds and distance, uh, nautical miles, and all those aspects that you'll remember. Then we discussed 
some high points, some case examples essentially of early exploration people in the Indo-Pacific region, essentially the Polynesian people that extended out into the Central Pacific and South Pacific colonizing islands as they went, and they were colonizers. They took supplies, they took pigs, they took plants to, to plant to grow crops. They were colonizing islands looking for new territories. And then, of course, the Greeks. You know, the Greeks came up with a concept of science. They had certainly commercial, commerce, interest, and then, you know, of course, conquest. And who doesn't want conquest, really? Come on. And then the, the Greeks, you know, they were the first to map the earth. They were the first to develop a latitude and longitude system. They were the first to recognize that the earth was a sphere and not like when you look out the window, like I'm doing right now, it's, it's actually not flat. I, I have a, still have a hard time believing that, but the earth is roughly a sphere. And they calculated in 300 BC, they calculated an accurate size of the, of the planet within very small tolerance. And then, of course, later, about 300 years later, Ptolemy, and you know, Ptolemy was, was a cool dude, but he made some mistakes. And so he recalculated the size of the Earth and got it about half what it actually is. And unfortunately, that kind of got stuck right through to whew, the Dark Ages and, and beyond. And we didn't say much about the Dark Ages because it was so damn dark. But that was a time when the church basically controlled education, schools, universities too, controlled what you could say in a university. And in the Western world, uh, we had the Dark Ages. So if you want to find out more about that, I suggest the Search for the Holy Grail or some other Monty Python movie. They're, they're pre they, they do the Dark Ages pretty, pretty well. We jump then to the Renaissance, and we had these, again, commercial drivers for exploration. We had countries like Spain, Portugal, and England looking for conquest, money, gold, silver, you know, things like that. They weren't exactly spreading good cheer. And we had navigators, the first generation of explorers, ocean explorers with Columbus and Cabot and Magellan. Unfortunately, these guys were using Ptolemy's size of the earth and they thought the earth was about half the size it is. And when Columbus went west to get to India and he found the Caribbean, he landed in the Caribbean, he thought he was an Indian. And he, he called the native people of North America Indians because they obviously right and so there you go and then we discussed the first oceanographers like your friend and mine benjamin franklin coriolis and forbes and benjamin franklin was the first person to make a map of an ocean current so he mapped the gulf stream you know who would have thought coriolis studied movement on a rotating earth and so he th was thinking about how ocean currents would flow and how ships would move on the earth on this uh, watery surface as the earth essentially rotates out from underneath it. And then of course Forbes came up with this concept of the Azoic zone. No life in the deep ocean below about what 1800 feet. What a thing, right? We know that's totally wrong. And then in the middle of the 19th century, Maori in the 1850s, he's considered the first true oceanography. He made a big oceanographic atlas where he mapped currents, he mapped depths, he mapped the seafloor, coastlines, especially focused on the Atlantic and the North Atlantic even more so. Uh, he made lots and lots of depth measurements with rope soundings. And from that, he actually, with those depth measurements, he recognized that there was a topographic high on the seafloor in the middle of the North Atlantic. And we call it the Mid-Ocean Ridge today. He called it the Dolphin Rise. So he knew that there was a high out there, essentially a mountain range in the Atlantic. And I mentioned to you why that became so important. And it was this next one down here, commercial motives. And it was everything about email. You know, they were trying to send emails from North America to Europe. And the first email, electronic mail, was a telegraph. And they didn't have Wi-Fi, so they needed cables, and they were trying to lay cables. 
between North America and Western Europe. And it suddenly became very, very important whether the deep Atlantic was actually flat and smooth or whether there were mountains down there. And it turns out there were mountains, which really made laying the cable across the Atlantic extra challenging. There were lots of challenges, but that made it extra so. With this depth discussion soundings, we jumped into the photic zone, the upper true photic zone or euphotic zone, the dim dysphotic zone, and the completely dark. From there, we went to the beginnings of modern oceanography. The, that starts with the Challenger expedition from uh, the UK, from England. It was the first truly scientific expedition, old Navy ship that they converted into a scientific ship with labs and all kinds of equipment and chemistry labs, biology labs, all set up to study the ocean. And they spent four years cruising very slowly around the world's oceans, taking many thousands of depth measurements uh, they showed that the mid-ocean ridge was global. They found the deepest part of the, of the oceans in the Marianas Trench. It's called the Challenger Deep, named after the ship. Many, many other discoveries. And as I mentioned in class, a lot of this data, and it's still being cited and used even today. From there, we went to the, the Fram. Fram was a Norwegian ship. The plan was to lock it in the sea ice in the Arctic Ocean and get close to the North Pole. So essentially they could float on the sea ice as it's moving because there's no land in near the North Pole. It's all floating sea ice. And so their plan was to go upwind and then let the wind drive them toward the North Pole. And of course you know the story, they were way off course. And the captain went back to Norway and was discussing and trying to find out what went wrong with his plan. A physicist named Ekman pointed out that, of course, he wouldn't go downwind. He would move to the right of the wind because the Earth is rotating. And essentially, the Earth is rotating out from underneath the ice in the ship. And that produced this concept of the Ekman transport and Ekman spiral. And wind is blowing on the surface of the water, creating a shear. And right at the very surface, the water is moving with the wind. But because the Earth is rotating, it creates a spiral downward into the water column. And then if you add up all these vectors of movement, getting weaker and weaker as you go down from the surface, the net direction is actually to the right in the northern hemisphere. And that's Ekman transport in that surface wind-affected layer about 100 meters or so. Ekman transport is to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. From there, we went to the 20th century, World War I, World War II, and the Cold War all the way to the present. There's often a lot of technology and advances that come out of uh, military investment, essentially government investment. One of the first examples that we spoke about was in the 1920s, the German meteor expedition. And, you know, we, it's a very interesting expedition. We spoke about chemistry and Fritz Haber, crazy German guy who liked to blow things up and make, make materials for bombs. But he was on there to do some chemistry and try to extract gold from seawater to make some money for Germany. But then the big innovation on that ship was the most advanced sonar system in the world. Sonar was invented to measure distance in lakes in Switzerland, and it worked pretty well, but somebody thought of turning it downward and measuring the depth, the distance to the seafloor instead of horizontal distance. And so sonar was on this expedition, and the Germans did a lot of depth measurement, essentially mapping sections of the North Atlantic uh, ocean, seafloor. So from that we discuss the factors that control velocity, sound velocity in the ocean, and that's density. So the higher the density, the faster the sound waves go. And then that of course led to what controls density uh, in the ocean. And we've discussed the two factors, temperature and salinity. And then this, these terms for where those factors, the temperature changes and the salinity changes and the density overall changes in the thermocline, halocline, and pycnocline. From there, we discussed the deep sea drilling program. 
and some of the high points in the drilling program starting in the 1960s with the Challenger expedition. Challenger named after the the, the British ship um, in the 1870s. And then, of course, the U.S. had the, NASA had the space shuttle named Challenger. So those all come from that ship uh, back in the 1870s in England. So the Glomar Challenger was a, a drill ship that's decommissioned today. The Geordie's Resolution in the 1980s, and it's been refitted and recommissioned, so it's out drilling again today. And the modern, the most recent one, the Chick U, and it's shown over here in this little picture, um, is the most up-to-date, largest, sophisticated uh, drill ship, and it was built by uh, Japan. And we've discussed why Japan would be so interested in drilling into the seafloor, and particularly into the upper mantle. And then from there we discussed submersibles, bathyspheres, bathyscaphs, and then we talked and spoke about Alvin, the famous uh, submersible that has done so much uh, work, famous work, discovering things like hydrothermal vents on the seafloor and usually doesn't involve any chipmunks. And then the Japanese Shinkai, which can actually go deeper than Alvin, so Shinkai can go six kilometers. And then we, we started discussing ROVs, remotely operated vehicles, and the real innovations today in remotely operated vehicles and the advantages and disadvantages of those and particularly Bob Ballard's system that he's instituted with uh, NOAA, the no National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the, and the ship, the research ship, um, Okeanos Explorer. And then finally, we get to the modern era with satellites, remote sensing. So studying, sensing the oceans from space using satellites. There's been all kind of innovation in that in terms of biological distribution, temperature distribution, and even CO2 and chemistry. Currents, topography, El Nino, lots of amazing information has come from satellite studies. Right before spring break, we did a short section on water and intro to chemical oceanography. We talked about the origin of the water molecule, what makes it unique and special, uh, its structure, properties, chemistry, and so we, we talked about the origin of the water molecule and where they're found, relationships between oxygen and hydrogen, why they bond so strongly together. It's a strong covalent bond. But then the water molecules themselves are stuck together with hydrogen bonds. And we discussed the three-dimensional tetrahedral structure, polar structure of water, water molecules with those hydrogen bonds gives water its really unique superpowers. Things like capillary effect, surface tension, allows mosquitoes and other insects to walk on the water surface. The chemistry, the polar structure allows water to pull apart salts and things that are bonded ionically very, very effectively. Water molecules surround uh, the cations like sodium with their negative ends, negative corners, and pull the sodium off the, the salt and the positive ends, the hydrogen stick to the chlorides and pull that apart. So water is an extremely effective solvent at dissolving certain compounds. And then we got to this hard, interesting, but a difficult subject, and that's discussing the interactions that occur between water molecules, between water molecules and ions, and between ions and other ions that are in the water. And so we, we spoke about, we learned in intro chemistry to just use simple concentrations. So we measure out amount of a compound that we put and dissolve in water. The thing is, it's not all available for chemical reactions, especially when you get to a salty solution like seawater. And so it's a little bit like finding out that Santa Claus has died. God, that's so sad. But it's a concept called activity. And activity basically means the effective concentration of an element or compound in water, and especially a salty water solution like seawater. As much as over half of some elements 
in seawater are not available for chemical reactions because they're tied up with water molecules around them and they're tied up with other ions around them. We discussed the major ions in seawater and I just summarized this in the table in the next page so you'll have that again. And then right before Shad, we went to the Shad Aquarium and can you believe we went to the Shad Aquarium in March? There were no travel bans or anything. We were, it was totally legit but it wasn't that crowded. Uh, and we got to see a lot. And one of the main connections that we saw in the Shed Aquarium was the interaction between photosynthesis and calcium carbonate precipitation and organisms that exploit that relationship. And so we, we spoke about carbonate being important in terms of the chemistry of seawater controlling the pH because bicarbonate is a buffer. It can be an acid or a base. And so it absorbs acidity and it holds the, the pH of seawater around 8.2 to 8.3. We did this, we came back to this biogeochemical relationship between photosynthesis and the carbonate system. And any organism that can exploit that synergistic relationship between the two, and I gave you the chemical reactions and we discussed that, any organism that can exploit that synergistic relationship, they are the ones that have taken over the coral, the reefs. I started to say coral reefs, but reefs, because reefs in Earth history have not been coral reefs. There, sometimes there have been coral reefs, and like we have today, but in most of Earth history, there are other organisms, including bacteria, sponges, and even clams formed reef during the age of the dinosaurs. So here's that table that I promised you. Uh, we did this in class, uh, cations, the major cations in, in seawater, sodium, 11,000, magnesium, calcium, and potassium. And then we dropped down to single digits. So there are just four that are in double and triple digits and higher of cations. And then anions, negative charges, chloride is the highest at about 19,000. And then sulfate, so important, sulfate and sulfur chemistry in terms of life and chemical reactions is almost 3,000 parts per million, 2,700. And here's that bicarbonate at 140 parts per million. Not very high. It should be higher, but organisms like to use it to make their skeletons. So they take some bicarbonate and some calcium and they make their shells and skeletons. And so they're removing it as we speak continually for billions of years it's been going on uh, they've been pulling it out of seawater first it was bacteria they didn't really mean to do it but they were driving that reaction and precipitating calcite and then later it was animals and algae and then finally bromine a weird weird element 67 but below that it's just single digits so there's just eight elements that are even double digits in terms of um, parts per million in seawater. And then we did something very interesting right before spring break. We were talking about some chemistry of seawater and then I said, you know, it's actually pretty interesting to compare the fingerprint, chemical fingerprint of seawater. And we made this graph in class and it's 11,000 parts per million for sodium. And here's magnesium like 1290, about 1300. And here's calcium about 400. And here's chloride, the, the, the highest concentration element in seawater at 19,000. And then uh, sulfate, bicarbonate, and I put silica on here. So, and I put it in silicon dioxide, but in water it's usually silicic acid. So it's um, like H3SiO4 with um, a minus charge on it. Like in, in river water, that's normally what it is in, in seawater too. And I compared that, this kind of fingerprint, the exact same elements to river water. So the stuff that's flowing in to the oceans uh, from all the world's rivers, the average global river water looks like this, and something very striking happens. The number one dissolved material in river water is bicarbonate. So we've dropped down a couple, three orders of magnitude, and now we're down to 60 parts per million. So this means less salty. So you could drink river water, although I wouldn't suggest it most of the time. And then here's seawater. And so you don't want to drink seawater. I Trust me, I've done it many times and it's not pleasant. It doesn't work out very well. Usually you end up getting kind of sick. 
But so here's, here's river water and with bicarbonate. Calcium is number two. So calcium is way down here with um, seawater and number two is sodium. Sodium is pretty low and magnesium is low and even even chloride is very low. So all these, and now suddenly there's 20 ppm approximately of silica, silicic acid in, in river water. Where is that coming from? It's like weathering and breakdown chemical reactions with minerals and rocks. So silicate minerals uh, breaking down and releasing silica to the water. Now, let's address this bicarbonate. The bicarbonate, about half or so of that is coming from and a lot of this calcium is coming from dissolution of limestone uh, on the continents. So it's coming from silicate minerals too, but much of this is coming from old limestone and old dolestone that's dissolving and making bicarbonate and making calcium in river water. But the other half to maybe 60-70% of this bicarbonate is actually coming from oxidation of organic matter. So organic matter in soil zones, like right outside the window here, I see some soil and some grass, and organic matter is breaking down, oxidizing, and that makes CO2. The CO2 reacts with water, hydrolyzes, and makes carbonate and bicarbonate carbonic acid. That gets washed into the rivers, the world's rivers. And of course, that flows out to the oceans. So the carbonate, is being used in the oceans so it's a lot of it is being delivered to the oceans but it's being consumed by organisms and to make their shells and their skeletons and just precipitating as calcium carbonate finally if we compare rainwater to these other two water sources something interesting happens we drop down another order of magnitude now we're down to like four parts per million for the maximum and the fingerprint, though, of rainwater looks like seawater. That kind of tells you where rainwater comes from. Most rainwater comes from evaporating ocean water, and some of those salts get carried up. Rainwater is essentially distilled water, but a few parts per million of dissolved elements in it, and it looks like seawater, with sodium and chloride being number uh, one and two, or two and one. Chloride number one, sodium number two. All right, to summarize that little section, seawater is a sodium chloride solution. River water is a calcium bicarbonate solution. And rainwater is just a very dilute version of seawater. Okay, so where are we going? We're going to look next at ocean basins, how they exist, why they exist, and how they've evolved and how they affect the ocean's water themselves. And then finally, it's a very interesting story, but the plate tectonic theory came from, mostly came from the oceans and study the oceans. So this is a really interesting topic and you'll have to go to the next video, which is coming shortly and dive right in. I'll see you then.